We all can remember that favorite storybook that we read over and over, the one our parents could recite in their sleep, and we also can remember the characters and the morals of those stories. These are the lessons we likely still live by today when we're searching for that right answer or that right choice when we want to move forward. My guest today, Paul Collins, is the owner of Moonlight Puppies, a publishing company that specializes in writing children's books that demonstrate strong lifelong principles. With beautiful illustrations and character development, we can reach the heart of every child's imagination as they listen and learn to these stories. As you consider the programs your children may be involved in, and I'm aware of the characters now as a part of my grandson's life, we need to look at the messages that those characters are sharing and how we support our youth to be their very, book, their very best, one good book at a time. You're listening to Be Well with Michelle Greenwell. This is sponsored by the Kate Breton Tea Company and Dance Debut Inc. And I'm really excited to have multi-author Paul Collins to join me today. Hi, Paul. Good morning. Thanks so much for having me on. Oh, it's so beautiful to be here and to be talking about children's books because it definitely is a passion of mine. Um, before we dive in, let's um, set things up for our audience to be able to receive a balance and feel um, that they've had a little bit of nourishment themselves as, a, as they've listened to the podcast. And I usually pull a card from my affirmations for the body and biofield deck. But today, because we're talking about children, I wanted to pull something from the It's in the Cards deck, which was designed for kids and is an opportunity for parents to be able to have energy tools to help kids to calm, go to sleep easier, or to uh, be able to focus or to bring their energy into balance just if they're trying to bounce off the walls from being inside too long. Um, and so I pulled the card today for, I hope I can get this through the light here. So this is a little tiny cricket. So it's the wood element, the color's green, and there's a sound on it that says, shh. And at the bottom, it says three pushes. Three pushes comes from Tai Chi, where we actually massage our feet by rocking back and forth in our feet. And children will often do that when they're standing and trying to tell us something, but they're a little bit anxious about what they want to say. And they'll, they'll do that little bit of rocking. So what I'm going to invite people to do is think about um, how they can rock back and forth on their feet. And I wanted to bring in one more tool that I thought maybe you could do with me, Paul, <laughs> which is putting fingertips on the forehead. And this one is to calm. So if we were rocking back and forth in our feet and we just put our fingertips to our forehead, that's a great way to be able to produce a calmness. So if somebody's having trouble deciding something or expressing themselves, this is a great way to do it. And that's all you need to do. And that sound of shh is the sound that a cricket makes, but it's also a great way to shift the body away from maybe some anger or some angst. And you just, you can just say, shh, 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 and you could make up a tune if you wanted. All right, that was probably more than, <laughs> than you needed to know about uh, some ways to help kids. Um, let's bring some tea into this. Have you got any tea with you today, Paul? I do. Some iced tea. You got? You've got iced tea. What, I and, tea. Any particular kind? Uh, green tea. Okay. Yeah. And usually, do you drink it cold? I drink my coffee hot. I drink my iced tea cold. Awesome. Awesome. All right. And you have it in a thermos. Yes. Is it a one that you use all the time? Uh, yeah, I sort of use it. It's nice for coffee in the morning and uh, iced tea in the afternoon. And you got the one container you carry around. It's a good size, fits in my car in the middle, <laughs> in the middle between the two seats. And, uh, you know, it's big enough that you don't have to refill it every hour. So uh, that's good. what I was thinking about. It's probably one where you can gauge how much liquid you've been able yeah. to consume across the day. Yeah. Perfect. Um, I was thinking about storytelling and what happens around a campfire. Right now we're covered in snow. So our campfire fire pit is totally, you can't even find it. Um, but I put together beach bonfire and this is the flavors of what would be a s'more. So your, your caramel, marshmallow, Graham wafer, chocolate kind of piece. For those that haven't had a s'more, you usually melt the marshmallow over the campfire, and then you take the cookie wafers and you sandwich it with a piece of chocolate. 
lovely. So that's what's inside my mug today. I thought I'd, I'd bring a little of the campfire in. So cheers to you and thank you very much for joining us uh, on the podcast. And Thanks we for say slaunch. Slaunch <laughs> it, absolutely. Awesome. Okay. All right. So from there, you have a an amazing story, I know, of um, transformation. And you and I've talked about some of the different things you've experienced. Do you want to share a little bit about how you got into writing books and what what led you on that journey? Sure. No, again. Um, yeah. So I, I started out as a, you know, career investment banker, uh, you know, a finance numbers guy, travel around the world, um, and honestly didn't spend that much time at home, got married late in life, and uh, kind of had my kids a little bit later. And, um, you know, when I actually had some time to come home and sit down and read the books, I, I was quite disappointed with the the messages in the books and the artwork and some of the messaging wasn't on point in how I sort of grew up. I grew up in a Christian background, Jesuit boarding school, you know, strong family, sort of culture background. Um, and sort of, you know, I always felt books should have sort of family values or a moral compass or, you know, they should have action stories to get the kids involved, have some fun, have some mental challenges in the books. And, um, you know, I think anybody who's had kids has gone through the experience of, hey, dad, tell me a story. And it's that's how it started. It started with, you know, dad telling me a story. And, and the first one was my, my son asking me a story about uh, a dragon. And that was what led to the dragon's treasure. And, and at the time, I was trying to teach him how to count to, to 10 and say please and thank you. And you don't get uh, ice cream unless you finish your dinner, things like that. So I, I ended up creating this really nice story about a boy who, who has to go through all these challenges that the king's knights can't get through get to the treasure so he can help people buy food and, and save the people in the kingdom. But, you know, how you sort of work things in, one of the challenges he had to get through was, was getting past the octopus who could, you know, hold eight swords or throw eight spears. And, you know, he was telling the little boy, there's nothing that you can do that I can't do better. And the little boy says, well, I can count to my 10 fingers. Can you? And of course the octopus cut. So it's sort of using the imagination with the kid to sort of get them to do things and have them participate in the story. Um, and, you know, I started off and, you know, I didn't know anything about publishing or ebooks or social media or so it was a big learning curve coming up and trying to learn all of that. And then most recently, you know, I decided that, um, you know, having traveled a lot, worked a lot, that I want to spend more time with my kids. Uh, so I retired about a year ago and I'm spending more time now on my books. I'm actually writing a, a book with one of my, with my son on climate change, which is a passion of his. And, um, you know, I want to spend more time because in six years, I've all gone to college. Uh, and, um, you know, who knows how often you'll see them and where they'll end up. I, I was born in Dublin. And I ended up here in the States. So you don't know. And I want to enjoy their time and spend time with them. And, uh, you know, that's one of my regrets with my dad. I didn't spend more time with him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, too, when you look back as an adult and an older adult and you look back on those times and your choices when you were trying to you know, put your independence in, but also that separation piece. Um, and then what is the role that our parents do play for us? And uh, what stories do they bring back? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so as you've worked your way through the different parts of the book, I, as you're describing the, the dragon and um, in the castle, you know, like you already had me captured. <laughs> just with the details that you put in there. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you develop the characters in your books? Yeah, it's, I guess my, my writing is a little bit different. I, I tend to start with, with a need. So for so example, my, one of my kids will come to me and say, dad, can you tell me a story about um, um, Christmas? I'll make up a Christmas story. So, you know, and I would sort of, okay, boy, there's an idea. So I'd go away and kind of think about it. And I, I would sort of sit down and I'll give you an, an example is a story I wrote, uh, Ellie the Eagle, uh, the Rockefeller Christmas tree. So I mm -hmm. sat down, I, I said to her, well, what do you love about Christmas? And, you know, she said, well, we were in New York and I love the Rockefeller Christmas tree. I was like, okay, Rockefeller Christmas tree. And then I thought, well, what's, you know, that's an iconic image of Christmas. What's the iconic image of America? It's the American Eagle. So I took the two together and uh, came up with a story uh, about the Rockefeller Christmas tree, which, which um, 
you know, she grows up on a farm and the, and the tree is cut down and becomes a Rockefeller Christmas tree. But in it is how is this nest uh, with, with four eaglet eggs. And she and the eaglets become friends and she gets on the eagle and flies to New York and I'll let you read the book. Um, you know, <laughs> she saves the day. But it sort of brings all the images of, 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 of it together. But it starts off with a, an idea and then I sort of think about what characters make sense and how to pull it together. So it's sort of a, a, a sort of thinking process. Uh, and then what I like to do is sort of build messages into it. Um, you know, in that case, it was about helping others. You got to help your friend, and true friends will really have your back and will step up to the occasion. And then for fun, I put my kids in the book. You know, so you know when people look at the book, actually, they're, very often they're my kids when they were younger. So it's a lot of fun. And and so if you look at some of the books I came up with, uh, the Seamstress and the Prince, um, that was my my eldest daughter wanted a, a princess story. And, you know, you, there's, there's great stories out there. We all know the names. But I wanted a story that was a little bit different and had a twist that was more modern. Mm -hmm. So in that story, you know, the, the little girl, you know, she starts off and she, she goes to fight. And she's an orphan. She goes to fight for the king in, in the war and she loses her leg, comes back as an army vet. And, um, you know, she had fallen in love with the prince, but the prince didn't know her because she had no money and she was in tatters and she had, you know, she didn't have very much. And the king and the queen wanted to find him a good wife, you know, so he'd have sort of a good backing. And so they hold all these competitions. And with the help of the animals in the forest, she actually ends up winning the competitions. And she's afraid at the end that he won't love her because she has the handicap. But he's like, it doesn't matter. I love you for who you are. But the twist of my story is because she's so brave and clever and resourceful, the king makes her general of the armies and the prince is stay-at-home dad. So it, it is the, <laughs> you know, it is a classic but a twist for the world we're in because there's so many brilliant women that are you know the home yeah. the home givers the providers they're both working they're working you know and i think that's a message that's really important for my girls yeah um, you know and then i took the ellie the eagle character which i think is is iconic for the country and i i, I wrote this book about the history of new york city um through her eyes where she flies over uh, the city and tells the history of New York City and is dedicated to first responders because of their bravery in 9-11 and deals with these concepts and deals with immigration and, and, and these issues we deal with. Um, but it's done by an artist who's brilliant at sort of landscaping and big visuals. So the artwork is spectacular. And, and actually, you know, I have a YouTube video, Ellie the Eagle, the Rockefeller Christmas Tree. So if you want to get a sense of what it's all about, I encourage people to go flip that on. It's eight or nine minutes, but it gives you a very good feel for the sort of the story and and what goes on, um, and then uh, you know another another story was um, my son wanted a story about that tarantula spider, and I was like, Ugh, you know, I mean, how do you how do you write? What a story? do I do with that one? Yeah. yeah, what do I do with that one? That was tough, and and then we had this uh, lovely teacher who was in here doing a little bit of uh, babysitting for us, a friend, and uh, she said, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had a story about you know bullying that I could sort of you know do my you know, with my third grade kids first week back at school, talk about the concept of bullying and why it's not a good thing. So I sat down and ended up putting this really fun story uh, called Tony the Tarantula, which is a little bit of a play on The Sopranos. Um, and uh, this tough guy who at the end of the day realizes he's not quite as tough as he thinks he is. Mm -hmm. And because uh, all these kids have special talents that uh, he can't match up to. So, you know, it's, it's a really good book. And I think artwork is super important. I think having sort of trivia having uh, characters, a humanization of, the, you know, of a, a tarantula spider, making him almost look like a little boy, but he's got features of a tarantula. So the kids can relate to it. You know, it's not, and, and I think one of the, the, the things that I loved the most was when I told the Ellie the Eagle story to my, to my daughters, I think it was a first grade class. I had several kids come up to me af afterwards and ask me if the story was real. So think about it. You've got this little girl flying on the back of an eagle over New York City. Of course, it's not real, but it's their imagination. And if you can yeah. capture kids where they actually think the story is real, that's fantastic. I mean, that just every time I think of it, it puts a smile on my face. Yeah, absolutely. And then that just opens up their their world of possibility because they don't have the confines of of us saying whether it's real or not real. Yeah, and does it matter? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so you were talking about the artistry. So I know when you're publishing books, depending on, you know, what publisher you're working with, 
who who's going to be the artist for your book is sometimes decided for you, but you have uh, very specific um, requirements that you put in to those pictures. Tell me about working with the artists that you do work with. Yeah, I mean it, that was that's a it's a great question because there's so many good artists out there. You know, when I when I first started this, it was like, well, what artists do you use? So I I went into a number of libraries, bookstores, um, looked at books, looked at some art I liked, I went online. There's some really good uh, sources to go to sort of find illustrators. And then I, I honestly, I probably looked at 1,500 artists. Oh my god! Uh, yes, um, over over a period of two years. Uh, to find ones where I really like their style in certain books and with certain characters. And I ended up picking eight that I actually work with. Um, and they all have slightly different nuances. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it's so what I do is when I when I think of a story, I'm, I'm instinctively thinking about what the look is mm -hmm. and which those artists, you know, is really best suited to that look. So I'm working uh, with an artist uh, called James Madsen, who does unbelievably good uh, humanization of sort of animals. Uh, where it's, you know, we're doing one, actually, my son's book on climate change is being done by him, and uh, Tony the Tarantula was being done by him. And it's it's really kind of a, a fantastic, it's fantastic to work with them because they're so creative. You can give them a little bit of guidance, boom. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you can tell them that you did something like this in books X, Y, Z. I want to kind of take that and do a little bit more of this or that, the other. And they're so talented. They can, it doesn't, you know, you'd be surprised how quickly the artwork, once you, the hardest part to do is to find the style you like. Mm -hmm. But if you know what that style is, then you're just creating characters. And that's where it's really fun with the kids. You know, we sit down and we design characters. We just did this for my son's um, climate change book where we're coming up with names for characters. So one of the the, the, the girls in the book is called Planet, the planet. <laughs> right? So another book about a, a, an African slave girl, it's called Atacar. And Atacar comes from the first three initials of my daughter's first names, Adeline and Caroline. So it's Atacar. So, you know, it, it's sort of fun to sit down and do this and design the characters and how would you like, you know, the, 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 the character to look and, but, you know, you know, bushy hair, blonde hair, tall, short, you know, that's a lot of fun. And, and so, you know, I picked those, so I, I, you know, I picked, I wanted a, at one point a very sort of old classic kids book from when I was a kid. So I picked this artist who was brilliant doing watercolors. And he did uh, Connor the Crafty Crocodile, like I'll call James Bennett, which is an absolutely beautiful book. And um, then I have more of the traditional sort of Disney Pixar type look, that classic movie um, book, you know, where I got a couple of Latin American artists, um, Omar Aranda and, 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 and uh, people like um, Dennis Alonzo to do those books because they're very good at that sort of type of look. So that's how I picked them. And, you know, what's really interesting is, is yeah, sometimes you don't know why books resonate with kids. I've got one book that's Moonlight Puppies. It's a Halloween story. Um, but for some reason, that really resonates with kids on the spectrum, um, that's sort of on the autism spectrum. And, and there are some kids, I'm told by their parents, that won't go to bed unless they read the book two or three times before they go to bed. And they'll sleep with the book in their, they'll sleep with the book in their bed. You know, and, you know, I look at the art and I go, yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting. But it's all about what resonates, mm -hmm. and um, you know, it, it's that's the fun of it. It's it's um, so I, you know, I'd really recommend. You know, people call me sometimes and say, "Well, what artist would you recommend?" <laughs> and it's all a question: is what style do you want? What look do you want? What feel do you want? Because art, you know, most thing about it, kids are either can't read or beginning to read, so the artwork is everything. Yes, art tells a thousand words, so that that art has to pull them in. And get them excited yeah. so you need action you need bright colors you need interesting characters you need visualizations and expressions uh so all of that comes into sort of picking the particular artists i use for a book mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you were talking about too about the animals because the animals they have to be able to reflect human characteristics so drawing those kids in that's not an easy feat um you know, it's one thing to be able to draw the bear, but it's another thing to have that bear have a grin that says something or a twinkle in his eye. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. When you look at 
how your children have grown up with these stories? How, how has their life been transformed by the way that you're able to bring the storytelling in and share these messages with them? How do you think that's changed for them? Um, I think from, from, from my perspective, it's allowed me to get a lot closer to my kids. Um, you know, it's, I think sometimes when you're a parent, you're traveling a lot, you know, a lot of parents have this, you know, you work a lot, either you're both on the road or one's on the road and, you know, you don't see your kids as much as you'd like to. Um, and I think by doing this together, you, you develop characters, you get closer, they, you know, it's more of a discussion and a dialogue and it's fun. And, and I remember when, when I was uh, running the first time I, I uh, you know, it's great because you get these, and you get these priceless moments, right? So I want a great example is, is my wife said I shouldn't tell this, but um, is, is when I was with my, my, my youngest daughter and I, we, we had um, In Search of Bear, which is a beautiful book about a bear who gets bored with his teddy bear and goes on this journey around the world and interviews the five big bears to see if they'll come home with them. And one of the, the bears is the panda bear. And the panda bear is like, look, you know, I'm on the, you know, the, the, the extinction list and I, I, I can't move. I'm not allowed to move. And I eat all day. I eat, you know, 20 hours a day and I, you know, I poop 40 to 50 times. And, um, you know, that's, and, the, and, and he goes that, you know, the little boy goes, well, that's a lot of poop. I'm not sure I, w- I want to bring you home to be in my house, you know? And my daughter, you know, who's like six, five or six, she turns around, she goes, no, daddy, he's got a big tummy. You got a big tummy. And I said, yeah, well, is there anything I, you know, it's okay. Is there anything I should do about it? She goes, well, you should poop more. And it's like, you know, it's, it's the sheer, <laughs> you know, it's the sheer innocence and we roared laughing. I mean, it's just roared laughing. And, you know, it sort of brings you closer to them. It, it puts you at a level with them that, that it's, it's, you're almost, you're their friend, you're hanging out. You're, I love telling riddles and jokes and uh, there's, you'll see in my books, there's a lot of trivia. There's a lot of jokes. There's a lot of puns. Cause I think parents should get a kick out of the book. So mm-hmm. when you read my books, you know, you've got a little bit of that Shrek humor that, uh, you know, it's like yeah. tongue in cheek. Yeah. Okay. So it's interesting for parents yeah. as well as kids. And so I feel like, you know, and I think my kids now have an interest in creative writing. Uh, my mm-hmm. son, you know, wanted to say, hey, dad, look, I'd love to do a book on sustainability. Let's sit down and brainstorm. What do we do? How do we do it? Um, and I think they, they also, I, you know, I've gone into their schools and, and, and given uh, creative writing, um, you know, lectures to, to the kids and, they see the value and, you know, hopefully one of them will turn around. She'll, he or she will want to write someday. Mm-hmm. So it has lots of sort of tangential benefits. And then, you know, I talk to them about the business, setting it up, how you do that, what the issues are, how tough it is to make any money, you know, as a writer, or a publisher, it's really hard. It's like mm-hmm. a lot of people write books. What makes a good book? You know, are you doing it for money? Are you doing it for something else? Why would you not do something for money? I mean, there's a lot of lessons that you can, um, discuss with your kids, um, which I think are really important life lessons. Uh, you know, with my son, you know, you know, here's what it costs to set a business up and he wants to be an entrepreneur. So this is great. You know, it's, you know, setting up bank accounts, setting up LLCs, you know, all of that is stuff that uh, you as a parent don't get the opportunity to teach kids in, in sort of the normal, normal mm-hmm. life. Mm-hmm. That's been great. Yeah. And then that opportunity to that jumping board for them, They've got that one under their belt. So whatever they decide to do next, um, it's not as scary because that just that first time is always so tough. Right. Um, yeah. And you're catching your kids too in their teens. So they're, they're not in early adulthood yet. They're, they're still ahead of that. And that's when they can still be listening. And um, you, you have an audience that is willing to work with you, you know, sometimes too, they want to go off, do their own thing by the time they've hit that, the early twenties. Um, but you've already got that relationship established, which is really interesting. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, what is next for you? I know you're working on this book with your son. Do you have something else coming along? Yeah, there's a couple of things. I've got this this book on climate change with my son that that uh, deals with you know, teaching kids the basic elements to understand what's going on and giving them some terminology. And it's sort of a very fun story. Uh, and I think uh, you know he he's going to go and, and take this and, and give uh, some some lectures and presentations to other kids in school in different schools. So I'm looking forward to seeing him do that and sort of taking it and growing with it. Um, 
I would like to write a book with each of my daughters. I think mm -hmm. it'd be really fun. I mean, the experience with my son has been great. So I'd love to do that. Just, you know, talk to them a little bit when they get a little, it takes a little while for them to find their passion. They're still a little bit young, but mm -hmm. you know, it's something that's really important to them. And then, you know, work on developing a book and a concept and a message and an action plan of taking it and doing some good for others. You know, it's one thing to do it, say I did it. Uh, I think it's much more important if you if you do it with a purpose in mind and you do it for good and you go help people. Mm -hmm. uh, because the the self, you know, you know, the self-gratification is really important in terms of what you get out of it. Um and um the other thing I'm working on, you know, I've been always been a big trivia. Uh, riddle sort of uh, puzzle person mm -hmm. um, you know when when we've got you know my my, my kids have friends over you know uh, summertime and we're all sitting around eating burgers and stuff uh, I'm always doing trivia games and riddles and stuff and so I'm actually putting a family game together um, mm. uh, which really is is a game that anybody can play grandparents can play against kids you can have men versus women boys versus girls you know you can do it based on age eh, so, you know, but it's, 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 you know, it's a game that anybody in the family can play and you can mix teams up any way you want. Everybody can play, uh, which mm -hmm. is very different because, you know, there's other games out there are great, but they're suited to certain age groups and you have to have knowledge of TV shows from the seventies or, or a pop from last month, mm -hmm. you know, and that for, for the average person, that's really tough. So coming up with a game that that's really fun for all, but actually tests the brain and mm -hmm. gets you thinking where you have to kind of work as a team to solve things. Uh, is really fun. So uh, that's what I'm working on. I've been uh, using some friends as guinea pigs to try it out. And the uh, response has been really good. So that's just a lot of fun, you know, because that's coming up with fun and unusual questions. Uh, mm -hmm. which forces people to sit down and actually think about things. But mm -hmm. a kid can do it just as easy as an adult. Yep. That's right. So that that's a project I'm working on that I'm um, hoping here over the next, um, you know, by the summer it'll be complete. And then I got to figure out how to produce it. Yes. I'm not sure I'm going to get into the, the games business, but I have to figure out where to go with it and what to do. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, It's interesting because on the one hand, you've talked about planning and preparation and, you know, knowing all these steps and pieces. And then there's the other part of you still, which is the designer, which is the um, I'm not scared to create it and I will figure it out. You know, I'll I'll know, which yeah, is really cool. Yeah, and I think, you know, it, it's important for people not to be afraid of things. Just, mm -hmm. you know, just because you haven't done it and it's unknown to you, uh, you can be pretty sure someone else has done it. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, you, there's only one person who's the first person to the moon, but there have been others since, right? So, you know, the, you know, I, I think that's what makes life really interesting is if you can discover passions, if you can discover things that you can get behind that are fun, get others involved. And you learn new things. I mean, uh, you know, for me, what I, I find interesting, and people say this, you know, in a way I'm lucky because I have the two sides of my brain. One is the sort of numbers, accounting, the, the organization, that part of it. And the other part is sort of an imagination and creativity. And it's really fun when they mix. Um, and uh, because I just think it makes, yeah, you know, I'd like to think it makes me a more interesting person. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm more, some people might say, yeah, I'm definitely wrong. But, you know, I think it just makes life a lot more interesting when you talk to people and you, mm -hmm. you, know, you try to educate your kids about what to do and to take risks and go into the unknown. Like my son wants to be an entrepreneur. That's as unknown as it gets, right? He doesn't know what yep. business or how to go about it. He's got some ideas. But I think some of these things I'm doing will help them sort of feel, yeah, it can get done. You know, you just have to make some phone calls and you can figure it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for those people that are listening and, you know, we talk about transformations, that that one piece is you're right. Somebody will have done it before. And and from what I'm listening and, and how you say things, you have that creative side, but you really have the caution of the logic side that allows you to dive into more detail than that creative person will just take and run. I tend to be more that person, but um, it just to think about that when you're making those transformations, yes, take a little bit of time to decide the, the way you want to go or how you might want to get there. And with the internet, there's so many ways now we can find who's done it before. How have people done it? What's their experience? But I think there's also something that's sort of internal in people. And, and I, I, I look back at an event when I was 16 and I was sitting at the, 
end of my parents' bed on this little French chair they had. And I barely fit in the corner. And you couldn't put your feet down. You had to put the feet, your feet in their bed. It had that much room. <laughs> and I always remember saying that if, I've ever, if I was ever going to succeed in life, I had to kind of change my outlook and my personality. I was this very shy, quiet kid. And my mom said it was like a light switch. The next day I was sort of outgoing and interested in everything people were doing. And I think everybody has to sort of self-motivate. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very hard to do. And I think that's, that's you know, success comes with self-motivation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not something that others can encourage you, but you have to turn the switch. Mm -hmm. And the earlier in life you can find that the early you'll sort of take risks or doing interesting things, I think more rewarding life will be. Um, mm -hmm. I really believe that. Mm -hmm. I love it. And when you say you just have to turn the switch, that's it's so nice to know it can just change. It doesn't have to take time. It yeah, can, but, but it doesn't have to. Yeah, and, and and it's not easy, you know. And I see this with my own kids, where like public speaking, everybody's afraid to do public speaking. Right. It's it's and, and young people in particular don't like getting up and potentially embarrassing themselves in front of their friends and others. And and um, and you just have to make yourself do it. You know, it, it's one of those things, you know, that, that the more you do it, you know, that the, the, the easier it gets. But be honest, I still get nervous when they get up in front of people and talk. You know, it's 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 human nature. You know, you don't want to be embarrassed. You don't want to look bad. But it's it's getting comfortable enough with yourself. You're saying, you know what? The goal or the desire is greater than the, the personal sort of uh, angst, and mm -hmm. you know it's it's one of you know when you go back and you look at the principles of life that I have in my books, mm -hmm. have the courage to act. Happiness comes from getting things done. Those are things that you know are, are on point here. You know you have to want something, and if you want something bad enough, you'll be prepared to make the sacrifices that you need to get there. Whether mm -hmm. you're an athlete whether you're an academic, whether you're a, you know, an actor, actress, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, but you have to sort of make that conscious choice at some point in your life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you brought in that piece that I did want to get to, which is your 10 principles of life. So you have your book, um, The Compass for Kids, which right. brings that in. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. No, um, in, in all of my books, my books all start out uh, with these 10 principles and they're introduced by a, a, a gentleman called Professor Science um, and <laughs> try to get, make it scientific. But it's really, you know, to me, the 10 messages that I want my kids to walk away with uh, in terms of values and morals and ethics and sensitivities um, that I really want them to have. So, you know, number one is family is the most important thing. Um, appreciate what you have. Uh, believe in your dreams, have dreams, believe in them, go after them. Uh, true friends will always be there you know, for you. And the reality in life is that, you know, you don't, you know, you, you have a lot less friends than you think you do. You have a lot of, you know, uh, mm -hmm. relationships uh, and acquaintances, but true friends, no matter what will be there, they won't judge you. They'll hear you out and they'll give you advice and, you know, they're, they're and as best they can always be willing to help others, which I think is really important. Um, Think before you act, uh, think before you speak, right? Have the courage to act is what we're talking about. Is that, you know, at some point you've got to step up and do things, even if you're uncomfortable, you get outside your, your what you believe are your own boundaries to do things that are important for you or, or for, the, for the greater good. Don't be a bully. Everybody is special. Um, you know, there are a lot of kids that need help. There are adults that need help. Don't bully them, help them. And lastly, you know, handicap shouldn't hold you back. You know, it, it's, um, you know, there are a lot of incredibly smart people that have issues, mental, physical, emotional, uh, and that shouldn't hold them back and people shouldn't penalize them. And, you know, I kind of learned, you know, this lesson a little bit when I was was 18, I got hit by a drunk driver and, and had 42 fractures and uh, missed my first year of law school. And, um, you know, I, I didn't want to fall behind my, my class. So, you know, and I, I got hit in December, I got out of hospital at the end of June, and I ended up, um, you know, studying in the toilet uh, and, and, and upstairs in the bathroom because it was the quietest room in the house and studied for six weeks and passed my exams and kept up with everybody. Um, and, you know, I had paralysis in my arm and I was uh, in a cast on crutches. Uh, but, you know, I was determined, you know, not to fall back. 
-hmm. because, you know, I wanted to, I didn't want my life to sort of change because something bad had happened, you know, and I think, you know, for people, it puts me in a situation where I realize how difficult it is for people with disabilities to do things. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, we don't appreciate how difficult it is. And I don't think we help people enough. And I think it's something that, you know, from the greater good perspective, we should be doing more of. Mm -hmm. um, and if people can figure out ways to do that, I, I you know, highly recommend and compliment it. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's so interesting. It's thinking about, we have a friend that uh, is uh, hearing challenged and, you know, we talk fast. We talk while we're walking away. We, um, we don't really listen because sometimes we're too busy talking. There's all these things that when I'm in the room with, with him, it is so awakening for me to stop and think about what is the message I really wanna share and how do I share it the easiest way because it's very tiring for him to dodge faces and try to turn himself so he can see the lips and um, he walks away to go do something and then a whole conversation happens and he wasn't a part of it. Um, it. It really is an interesting way when you start to reflect on how do I assist in those kinds of situations and how do I hinder? And what, what am I saying by making that hindrance possible? Um, it's a great lesson and it's been one where I've really stopped in other ways too, because you, like you said, when you've got you're on one crutch and you have an arm that's not going to function as you want it to function. How can other people really start to reflect on that and be supportive in the way back? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. All right. There's, there's so much happening for you and the books and, and the way they're going. There's one piece we didn't talk about, which is there is the opportunity to make money from books. You've been fortunate enough to have the sales that, that allows for that, but you also give back to charity. So do you want to talk about some of the charities you've chosen and that bit of the journey with the books? Yeah, it's, let me kind of take a step back. Um, and, and, you know, I actually haven't made any money from the books. Um, I, <laughs> everything I've made, I've actually given back into the charities, into a foundation. Um, and, um, you know, for me, I think it's a bigger, bigger thing, which is, you know, I think everybody should try and give back a little bit. Uh, some people are baseball coaches. I mean, I didn't grow up here. I grew up in Ireland, so I, mean, I didn't play baseball. So I'm not the person you want coaching your kids. I don't know the rules, I, you know, but, you know, I've got a, you know, I'd like to think I got a, a talent writing books and then coming up with fun stories and, 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 and value added stories. So, you know, for me, it was about creating a, a, you know, a, a fun way to sort of the messages were really important, getting it out and creating that. And, you know, right now, 100 percent of the proceeds go to charity. So it's it's not a big money maker. And I decided to self-publish, to be honest, because I can give a lot more to the charity than publish through a publisher because you end up with less than 10 percent. So there are choices I made. It's a lot harder to self-publish than go through a publisher because you don't have that big machine behind you and the advertising and the positioning. So it's a little bit tougher, but, you know, it's a, it's a little bit more personal. So it's much more of a personal project for me. Um, the charities that I, I, I you know, there's, there's a number of charities that I, I think are just really great. Uh, St. Jude's, uh, Shriners Hospital, uh, Orbis, which restores eyesight for kids with uh, various um, um, viruses and so forth. They get uh, in contaminated water. Um, um, I, I uh, smile train, uh, you know, kids with cleft lips, uh, prevent child abuse, um, silver shield foundation will looks after, you know, children of fallen firemen and, and, and first responders, which I'm a huge fan of. I think that they, um, give up so much for all of us. And, and, you know, it, it breaks my heart to see what happened in New York the other day with these, uh, first responders being beaten up by these, these, uh, individuals and, uh, that's not uh, the world we should be aspiring to live in. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I think these are all super, um, you know, doctors without borders. So they're all ch children focused mm -hmm. and, and some others. And, you know, I just think it's, um, you know, you can't give to everybody. So you're better off giving a little bit more to some. And then, of course, you know, you've got other ones. But they're the ones that are a little focused around the kids and, and, and the giving. Um, and, um, that's been a lot of fun. And so, so what I do for fun is that, you know, I take, I go, I give sets of books to children's hospitals and special needs schools if, if, if people want me to. 
And then uh, what's really probably the most uh, rewarding sometimes is uh, the good karma. I, I When I travel, I, I keep a, a box of books in the trunk of my car or I keep some in my briefcase. And if I see a little boy or a little girl at dinner or at the airport upset, I'll go over and sign the book for them and just give them a book. You know, it's just, you know, it's heartwarming. You know, it, it's... Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I sit there and, and, and you know, probably the, the, the memory that stands out in my mind most was, was when I um, wrote this story. My son wanted a story about a crocodile. So I came up with a story called Connor the Crafty Crocodile. And if you read the book, the book is actually best told by acting it out and, 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 and memorizing the rhymes and acting it out. But I have never in my life seen, a, you know, a kid belly laugh as much as he laughed uh, after that story. <laughs> he and he was five years of age and rolling around the place laughing and it was the sheer delight and joy um so i'm hoping that i could do that by giving my books out to some kids some parents that they get to enjoy those moments and uh you know help some people along the way you know i would love to make this more successful to be honest so i could give more mm -hmm. um it's and you know the issue you have is that uh, you know self-publisher so you know, a lot of um, places won't look at your books. Bookstores won't carry you because you don't go through the publishers. Uh, you can't get your books, you know, listed as a bestseller, you know, uh, and then you've got to do advertising yourself and everything else. So it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a more difficult proposition, but I think personally a more rewarding one. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> so for those people who are sitting there thinking, I don't know if I can do something, I'm thinking you just said, you know, it's difficult. I do it anyway. And here we go. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, you know, you have to, you have to take a step. And it comes back to, uh, you know, what, what do you want out of life? You know, I mean, that, I think that's something we all have to sit down and ask ourselves. Look, I mean, you know, I'm over the 50 yard line. Okay. I mean, it's, you know, God only knows what they'll come up with in terms of technologies and maybe that's not true, but I'm probably well over the 50 yard line and you sit there and go, what impact will I make on the world? What can I do? That's positive. I can be a good dad, a good husband, bring up kids who are honest, critical thinkers, see right and wrong. Um, you know, have the backbone to do something and the courage and the energy to go get it done. Right. So that's all great. But then what else are you going to do? What's your passion? How do you make something happen? That's tangible. And, you know, it sounds morbid, but when I got up and I gave my dad's eulogy, you know, I was like, wow, he did some really great things. And his passion was horses. And he set this Irish equine center up and he did a lot of great things for his industry. And he's remembered for that. And I think everybody has a talent. Everybody has a capability, an intellect, a talent. The question is, can you transfer that into a passion and, and, and somehow make that a positive giver for people and yourself? And if everybody tried to sort of figure out what that passion is and spend a bit of time nurturing it and developing it, you know, it, we'd make this a, a better community. We'd make this a better country, a better, you know, uh, better world because people are trying a little bit harder to, to sort of help, help everybody out. And, you know, you, I get a lot out of my books. I get a lot of fun out of it. I get a lot of fun talking to people with kids, uh, the stories that come out of them and, and the interest that look in their eyes. And, you know, that is sure joy it's great and i think you know baseball coaches get it and this you know we, when you you when kids get excited and passionate and you're helping drive that that's very gratifying and i think uh, we all get so jaded with work uh we're all busy with work i mean you just don't have time you know it's 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 you know i'm i'm i'm, I'm lucky i've been able to carve out a little bit of time i had a lot of plane rides to write these books um so, you know, but I think people need to take a step back in their lives and say, you know, what can I do? When someone gets up and says a few words about me, what are they going to say? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, when you get over the 50 yard line, you got to start thinking about those things and they become more important. You know, you've accomplished, you've done a lot of good things. You have a lot of, I think one of the things that we don't do enough of um, is mentorship. You know, there's so much you know, experience and talent in, in, in older people um, that, you know, can help young people who, who are struggling with where to go, what to do in careers. And you're better off having a mentor, frankly, who doesn't know you that well, who can be objective. Mm -hmm. Tell me the facts. Now, here's what I like. Here's what I don't. Here's what I think you should do. Now it's up to you, you know. Um, but I think that's something that we should all think about, you know, as, as we get older, can we be a mentor to two or three 
teenage kids or kids in their 20s that that need a bit of guidance and life career guidance you know whatever it is and i just think that's kind of what we're supposed to do when we get older maybe i'm wrong but mm -hmm. um i think those are the sort of things that i think about i mean charity is it can be money but i think more importantly it can be doing something or it can be your time mm -hmm. and it doesn't necessarily have to be to a an organization it can be into individuals because charity is broadly defined as helping right exactly. um uh, and I think that that's something that we all need to take a step back with and sort of look ourselves in the mirror and say, how can I make a difference? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Well, Paul, <laughs> I, you know, the, the books have um, depth themselves, but I'm, I really appreciate how you look at things and how you articulate it and the kinds of messages you're really bringing not just to kids because you're you're cultivating for teens and early adults um, with the way that you've approached raising your kids and spending time with them so uh, thank you for the the time that you are putting in to be thoughtful in that way and for the influence you're making thank you no my pleasure and, and thank you for having me and the only request i have is if people like what they hear spread the message you exactly. know exactly you know it, it's uh and look, if I can be helpful to anybody, you have my details, moonlightpuppies.com. So, yes. Yeah. And uh, do you want to say that again? Yeah. So, so my website is, it's uh, Paul Collins at moonlightpuppies.com. And actually, the easy way to track me down is, is go look up Ellie the Eagle, Rockefeller Christmas tree on YouTube. And um, I will have that link in the description. So people yeah, will be it, able to it's find really it. fun to watch. And it's got all my details on it, it goes through the 10 principles. And, but it's it's sort of something you can pull up and show your grandkids or your kids and it's just a nice intro to what this is all about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you, Paul. I always ask uh, my guests uh, some kind of movement based activity that you like to do um, that you could share. So as people have been sitting and listening, then getting that idea of how to get back and being active and you know what you partake in your day. What do you like to do? um boy uh, a lot of things are fun but I, I i love spending time with my wife uh, you know if i was to i just you know i adore her she's great um uh you know i love getting up in the morning having a cup of coffee you know we both read a lot research a lot you know try to figure out what's going on in the world and you know don't look so much as the at the narrative you see but you know what's going on behind the why is this is happening who's behind it what they're trying to do and you know debating that and usually by about 10 o'clock we've solved the world's problems and then we might go on a weekend and play golf so you know I, you know if i was to pick one door activity i like you know, and i'd prefer to do with anybody you know it's it's, it's my wife it's just great and i have to admit, admit i never beat her she's a better golfer than i am <laughs> um so my goal is to actually beat her at golf one day but it's just fun you know um to go out and chat and spend time you know, quality time and have fun and you know, golf is an interesting sport where it doesn't matter how the other person plays. It's up to you. It's your game. Mm -hmm. uh, but you learn a lot about people when you play golf with them, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's a very expressive sport. Um, and, um, you know, it's a great way. You want to, get to know, you want to get to know somebody and how they think and act in certain cir circumstances. You'll learn a lot. But that's, you know, playing golf with my wife and my son now. Mm -hmm. Great day. Great day. Awesome. That's beautiful. I love that. I did, uh, with all the snow that we've had here, I did the walk down into the, the most beautiful part of the snow and lied down and made a snow angel. <laughs> nice. Nice. Mine is always to find that way to play. And, um, I'm like you, you know, the more, the more time I have to play, I love playing with puppets and, uh, in the storytelling that I do, I'm always got puppets going, but it's really lovely to go and do some of those childish things. Um, because as soon as you post a video of that on social media, all the adults respond, you know, wish I could do that. Oh, I love that. I remember when, and that gets people thinking, maybe I should do something a little bit different too. So, yeah. Thank you so much for this time, Paul. It's, it's wonderful. And I will put all of the information into the description so people can find you, find the books. And I hope that they'll think about 
how they might be able to give that book as a gift, but also when they do what that means for you and your charities, because it'll be giving in two ways to the person receiving the book, but also to the charities that receive from you. So we'll oh, see really what we can do with that. that. Yeah. Thank, Thank you for you. having me on the show. Awesome. This is uh, season three of Be Well with Michelle Greenwell, and we've been looking at transformations and the magic that happens when we move forward and try to do things that we might not have done before. And as you've been listening to the different podcasts, we've tried to share different perspectives across time. And we're just approaching the end of season three, and we hope that you'll go back and listen to some of those podcasts again, or find ones that maybe you hadn't uh, dove into yet, and learn more. And one of them is the story of the family, the Moyo family in Malawi that my sister has been following, and that broadcast is always at the end of each month. All right, we wish you well. Take care and don't be afraid to make a change and try something new at your house. This is Be Well with Michelle Greenwell. <music>